I wish you a warm welcome and we're going to get started with our uh, the first webinar, uh, the first Wheel and Anchor webinar of 2021 that is Incredible Rail Journeys Part 4. So let me start off uh, and so for those who are uh, have attended many of our webinars just uh, um, you can put me on pause for a minute while I explain uh, again what Wheel and Anchor is all about for those who are perhaps new or who have not participated in one of our webinars. Our mission is about bringing travelers together. The bottom line is when you travel with people who you are at least acquainted with or uh, you know you, you have a sort of a like-minded um, idea of what travel should be all about and the experience that you want to have, it makes it a lot more fun. And so we are at Wheel and Anchor, a collection of people who enjoy each other's company, who have a great time. Um, and so it's old friends, new friends, but we're all about traveling together. And personally, my mission for everybody is to become well-traveled and well-connected. And as I always say, well-traveled is more about just uh, uh, checking off a, a box on your bucket list, but rather having had the experience about being in a place and really living, breathing, tasting, smelling the local culture, the traditions and everything that goes along with it. And in the course of doing so, you invariably become connected to um, to other people, whether it's your fellow travelers or to people that you happen to meet along the way. So that is my goal for you. Let me now introduce the team who is co-presenting with me here uh, today uh, from Wheel and Anchor, my colleagues, Joel, uh, who's a co-founder -co and provides our technical support, and Paula, whom many of you will have spoken with already, and she is our um, senior trip specialist and the person who you'll likely talk to on the phone if you give us a call. And our special guest this morning, uh, call, calling in from London, England, is Lara Newell. Uh, Lara is our video is off in a second, but I'm sure she's not too far away. Uh, and uh, hi, Lara. Uh, and Lara is with um, Belmont. That is the company that uh, owns and operates the Venice Venice Simplon Orient Express. Thank you for joining us all the way from London this morning. How are things over in London? Uh, you don't need to go into great detail because I think we know from reading the newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I definitely won't go into too much detail, but I'm staying positive um, for the year ahead. Uh, looking forward to welcoming loads of people onto our trains and cruises across our uh, portfolio um, and just staying warm, cozy inside my house where I'm told to stay. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, I think that's pretty goes for most of the people on our call calling in from Canada. Warm and cozy is uh, is the way to be for uh uh, as, as we, we get through the winter time. Uh, anyway, without further ado, um, let's talk a little bit about trains. Um, as I say, this is the fourth edition of our Incredible Rail Journey series, and we found a lot of interest um, in our programs. And I wonder why train travel? Like, what, what is it about train travel that makes it so interesting? And so, I, I mean, I've sort of speculated that uh, in, in the previous webinar that we did in, in December that I think that train travel is sort of one of these things that's coming into vogue. It's been around forever. I mean, it's been around a lot longer than river cruises and, and, and big ship cruises and all the rest of it. Um, but of course, I think we saw train travel or we used to see it much more as sort of a utilitarian um, way to get from A to B. Um, and uh, I, I think that, um, you know, if you consider some of the alternative ways of traveling and, and going, um, you know, from A to B in some places, like if you look at our, our you know, programs like our Trans-Siberian program or, or Rovus Rail across Africa, you cross landscapes that you just can't get to by road or not officially by road, efficiently by road, I should say. Um, but there are other reasons to choose train travel. And one big one is simply the nostalgia of it. It's just kind of neat to travel the way um, people did um, particularly in style, and that's what this webinar is really all about. It's train travel in style, like the best of the best. And there is a certain, uh, you know, appeal to that uh, about sort of dressing up and going for a fancy dinner while you're traveling from, you know, London to Paris or Paris to Venice um, or on the Orient Express, for example. And I, I think this allure, um, and for many reasons, is, is drawing people to consider train travel, and that's why it's going to be part of our upcoming itineraries in the near future. Um, just to cover off the webinars that we've done so far, I'm just going to rhyme them off in case you have not participated in them. We have 
of course, recordings of all of them available on our YouTube channel as well as on our website. So you can find all of those. We covered in the first one the, um, the so-called Silk Road Orient Express, which has got nothing to, that's why, we di that's why we differentiate them by the Venice Simplon Orient Express and the Silk Road Orient Express is a run that covers around the Stan countries. So we talked about that back in November. We talked about the uh, Al Andalus, which is a, a luxury train that goes um, through Spain. Um, we then went on to talk about uh, the Trans-Siberian, of course, which is the iconic journey all the way across Eurasia. Um, and we also, uh, did a special webinar on some African rail journeys by Rovos, um, talking about Cape Town in South Africa up to Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, as well as the so-called Copper Trail route, um, which goes from Angola uh, all the way over to uh, Victoria Falls. So two amazing African rail journeys. And then in our last webinar, um, just a couple of weeks ago, we uncovered uh, the uh, fabulous railways in Australia. First of all, the GAN, which runs from north to south from Adelaide, uh, uh, from Adelaide up to Darwin. And secondly, the Indian Pacific, uh, which goes all the way across Australia between Sydney and Perth. So, um, but today it's all about the Orient Express and, and the Palace on Wheels. So it's an interesting combination of journeys that we've got uh, on the agenda for today. Um, the Venice Simplon Orient Express, and Lara's gonna give us some uh, wonderful insight into what that experience is all about. Um, but it is, that and the Palace on Wheels are two of the most, um, how should we say, prestigious or luxurious rail journeys um, that are um, sort of out there whatsoever. And, and so, uh, that's why we sort of stuck them together, even though they have nothing to do with one another. But I just kind of thought um, it would be two interesting ones to talk about uh, this morning. So without further ado, uh, the Orient Express. So, and again, the Venice Simplon Orient Express is what it should say there on the label. Uh, Lara, there's a lot of history there. Um, and maybe you could help me in this, this kind of neat uh, cartoonish uh, like picture that we've got on the screen. Um, give us a brief history of, of the Venice Simplon Orient Express and sort of fast forwarding from its original origins and putting the carriages together to where we are today. Oh, thank, good morning. I didn't say that earlier. And uh, thank you for this lovely opportunity uh, to, to join this webinar and give you a little bit more um, in detail and in-depth history into this beautiful train. So the, the Orient Express, uh, dating all the way back to 1883, is when it took to the rails originally. Um, and in 1883, this was really a showcase of luxury and comfort um, in a time when travel was still regarded maybe as a little bit rough, a little bit dangerous. And so it was a bit of rich and famous um, travel between Paris all the way out to Istanbul. Um, and it was something that, as I say, is regarded as a, a luxurious journey. And this travel, or this train, sorry, um, operated for over 120 years before, sadly, it stopped operation in around 1976. Mm. One of the main reasons being that rail travel became competitive. There were trains that were a lot faster than the Orient Express. And there was air travel, which obviously made travel between destinations a lot quicker and easier. I and mean, as we all know, until recently, life became a lot more fast paced um, and a little bit less of the slow travel. Uh, and hopefully now more people will start to have that more of an appreciation for stepping back and really experiencing slow travel again. So in 1982, um, this is when the Orient Express was brought back to life. I mean, it's actually quite a nice story. Our previous uh, founder of the Orient Express, Mr. Sherwood, um, a private gentleman with quite a lot of money, um, had bought a hotel in Venice called Belmont Hotel Cipriani. And he thought, wouldn't it be nice to have a way of bringing all my friends, my family, from London down to Venice. And this is when he had the vision of bringing back the Orient Express. Um, he spent in excess of $16 million to wow. go out and find 35 sleeper carriages. He then brought them back to life. Obviously, a lot of these had been left derelict all across Europe. Um, so he spent a lot of money just doing a refurb and bringing them back together. And then he started the journey on, I think the first journey was in May 
in 1982, um, where the train traveled from London via Paris down into Venice, which now is, I would say, probably the most common journey that guests do, either traveling on what we call the southbound journey down to Venice, or the return northbound journey from Venice via Paris up into London. But as you can see from this map here, we do do some other journeys um, on board the train. So once a year, we do actually go all the way out to Istanbul, which was the original route of this beautiful train. Now, the reason why we only do this once a year is back in 1883, I think clients or people in general um, took a shower once a week, once every two weeks. Whereas now we take a shower once a day, maybe twice a day. Um, being a historic train, uh, the shower facilities on board are very limited um, and we do only have those available in the Grand Suites. And so in order to operate a journey out to Istanbul, which is a five night journey, we do have to stop the train en route and let guests get off and spend a night in a hotel. I personally quite like that. You get a taste of the destination as you travel um, on your way via um, the various different locations out to Istanbul, calling through places like Vienna, Bucharest, Budapest, and finishing up in um, Istanbul. In the old days, obviously, the train would just continue to travel. And um, whereas now you will have one night on the train, you will then spend one night off the train at your location get back on board the train and travel on to Istanbul. So the reason why the main route is now London to Venice is that we can operate that in one night without the necessity of you having to spend time at different locations um, as you travel um, down to Venice. So what we thought would be quite nice is to actually walk you through what a journey from London via Paris down to Venice would look like. That sounds like a good idea to me, Lara. So, um, so as, 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 as you mentioned, there are a, a number of different routes, but this is the most popular one. And when I was looking at what would make the most sense for our clients, I thought, well, you know, why not stick with sort of the, the tried and true? Um, and of course, both London and Venice being such great, great cities and great, a great place to start or end the trip. Um, you know, I thought it's a good one to take a look at. And so, um, you know, London itself doesn't need most much introduction, particularly to most of our members. I think, you know, I think the vast majority of our uh, of our uh, Wheel and Anchor members have probably been to London at some point or another. But you know what, it's one of those cities that particularly for Canadians, we have an affinity for. And so we'll always go back. Uh, I know I've been to London I, I, countless times. Um, and, and, I, and I love it every single time, you know, the, the pomp and circumstance and the royalty and all the rest of it that, that, that goes along with it. So, um, you know, we'd, we'd uh, in, in the context of a, a wheel and anchor tour, we'd probably go to London for a couple of days. Um, and then, of course, the big highlight, um, we'd, we'd, uh, we'd uh, take our limousine down to Victoria Station. And, uh, but we don't hop on the, the Orient Express yet at Victoria Station. What, what happens next? So what, what does the journey look like? So if we go back again to 1883, uh, the Orient Express did actually travel all the way from London. Um, and right. in order to ch cross the channel, though, it meant that the train was actually broken up and put onto a ferry. Um, so obviously this takes quite some time. So now what we've done instead is at London uh, Victoria, we have our beautiful check-in lounge where we would meet and greet all of your clients and check them in. Um, and here you would actually board the sister train to the Venice and Don Orient Express called the Belmont British Pullman. Um, so this is a train that's 10 carriages long. Um, every single carriage dates back to a different era. And this one here that we're actually looking at, um, Nelson Mandela traveled on it. So you can see in the marquetry work um, at the back, the woodwork there, you've got some springbok um, actually in that marquetry. Um, and the coloring is a little bit around the South African flag colors. So there's a little bit of history to each of um, these carriages. So once on board, um, you'd be met and greeted by one of our lovely stewards, as you can see there, and we would enjoy a brunch as we travel down um, to Folkestone. And so when I look at the picture, you know, you have this very elegantly dressed waiter like you'd find in the best, uh, you know, hotels in London. It begs the question, 
what is the dress code like? I mean, do we have to dress up to go on the Orient Express or, you know, can I wear a, you know, a jeans and a, you know, a fleece or, or am I going to look out of place? What, 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 what's expected and what's, what's normal? So we always say that the dress code is smart. So no jeans, no trainers. Now, everyone's version of smart is quite different. So once on board, you will find people that are simply in a suit and they look smart. And you will find other people that have gone completely all out and they will have the headpiece on and this beautiful, elegant dress. They'll have other dresses ready to change into in the evening as well. Um, so as long as you're not in jeans and trainers, we will let you on board. Um, we do encourage people to go all out, though, because at the end of the day, for some people, this is a once in a lifetime journey. It is the experience and that's part of the experience. And that's what I, I, I have not actually taken the, the, the train overnight myself, but I, I must admit seeing everybody all dressed up. Uh, I mean, it's only two days in the end and at the end of the day, but it's a great feeling. I mean, you know, go and pull that stuff out of the closet. You might not have used and, 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 you know, um, it, it's that that's part of the experience. So anyway, so continue on. So we take the train then to uh, Folkestone. So to the, uh, south eastern coast of of, uh, of the UK, um, and then we cross the channel by Eurotunnel, right? Correct. So we'll we'll collect you in some luxury coaches. Um, you don't need to worry about anything else at this stage. Just your little handbag to make sure you take that off the British Pullman with you, because once you've been drinking champagne all morning, and the simple things can become challenging. Um, but we'll take care of you then um, through that channel crossing. Um, and on arrival into Calais, we will actually pull directly onto the platform where the Venice and Plant Orient Express will be sat waiting for you. Um, and, you know, Gordon, I think I mentioned to you that it's, for me, such a beautiful part of the journey, this, because you arrive onto the platform and just on display is this beautiful gleaming train and stood outside, lined up, are all of our staff waiting to welcome you on board. So from the train manager to the stewards, to the chef, to one of the drivers, all there waiting to meet and greet you. Um, and from there, they will welcome you on board and they will take you directly to your cabin um, on board the beautiful Orient Express. And waiting inside your cabin will be your luggage for your journey. Um, and we will serve you with a nice, glass of bubbles as we carry on start you know carry on as we started um, and they'll leave you then to settle into your cabin and so on board uh, we've always wanted to keep this train as close to what it was when it originally started to travel right. Right. and so majority of our cabins on board are twin cabins so here this is an image of uh, one of our twin cabins and it's set up in the day setting and um, what will actually happen is in the evening when you go to enjoy your meal your dedicated cabin steward will actually come into your cabin and he will prepare your cabin into the evening um, presentation so being a train with a bit of fun um, all of the rooms, the twin rooms, are an upper and a lower berth um, bed. Um, you can have twin cabins that interconnect that give you a bit of extra space. Now, having said that we wanted to keep the train as close to what it was when it was originally in service, we did realize that there is a demand for that extra category of luxury. So what we did in 2019 is we launched three beautiful grand suites. So you can see one of these grand suites is pictured here. Stunning. And it is absolutely gorgeous. And we've just launched another three, um, which unfortunately were due to operate in 2020. That didn't happen, but they're sat there ready and waiting to welcome people in um, 2021. And I know that you can't, compare one to the other but they seem to be even more superior than what we did in 2019 and we've kept all of that beautiful marquetry work that woodwork and the paneling that you can see there you've got a double bed you've got a beautiful lounge area and the highlight probably of this is that you have your own ensuite shower um, inside your cabin you also have a dedicated steward serving you endless caviar and champagne throughout your journey as well so it just an absolutely gorgeous area to enjoy. 
And these are the washrooms um, for all of the suites on board as well. Just the attention to detail. Um, you know, these cabins, you've got to think that the, the people that did this marquetry back in the 1800s, it's a skill that I, I, sadly I think is, is um, yeah. being lost quite quickly. But we're fortunate enough to have some fantastic people that we work with in France and the work that they've done um, in these cabins, I hope you would agree, it's kept in line with what the train is about, but added a real edge of luxury um, within the train as well. So for a bit of extra exclusivity, the Grand Suites are situated right at the end of the train. And um, so you don't have anyone walking through your carriages. Um, that does, however, mean that you have a slightly longer walk to get to dinner. Um, the train has three restaurant cars that are situated in the middle of, of the train. Um, so we put them in the middle because actually this train is extremely long. Um, given the amount of food or the quality of the food that you eat, you would want to probably be walking that off a little bit. Um, so yeah, if you're at, in the Grand Suite, you have a little, that's the only thing, you have a little bit longer to walk, but you have beautiful scenery outside the window. So I definitely wouldn't be complaining about that. Exactly. And so the dining experience on board, um, well, actually maybe we'll, we'll go back one slide to the, to the, to the bar and the lounge. And so I think that, you know, um, it, particularly if you're, if you're traveling in one of the, the, the regular um, compartments, which are lovely, um, but you probably would spend most of your time during the day in, in one of these lounge cars. Uh, and that's where you enjoy, well, tell, tell us, uh, tell our members, what, what is the experience, um, you know, during the day? Like, you know, how do you spend your time? What happens on board? What does it look like when it's full of people here? So when you're doing the journey from London down to, um, down to Venice, you will have a the following day, pretty much the whole day on board the train. Right. Now, when I first traveled on this train, I originally came from the cruise industry where you have, um, you know, loads of entertainment on board the cruise ships. And I did think for a whole day, what am I going to do with myself on board this train? I <laughs> sadly have to admit that I never left my cabin until lunchtime. Because every time I got ready to leave, there was just more beautiful scenery passing past my window. Um, so actually, my morning, I spent in my pajamas, in my cabin, just watching what I called my, my TV screen uh, with this beautiful rolling scenery going past. However, after lunch, I did spend a good chunk of my afternoon in this beautiful bar car. Um, so here you'll have, obviously, um, an array of cocktails being served. Um, our stewards will be able to recommend a cocktail for you. Alternatively, you can choose one of your favorites. We do have a piano in the bar car as well, and we have a live pianist um, that plays throughout the um, duration of, of the journey as well. Um, and it just becomes the heart of the train. Um, you know, you'll, you'll go here for a drink maybe before dinner the day before as well after dinner if you want to come back into here and enjoy the evening and um, with the pianist playing everyone stays awake well at least the staff stay awake until the last client goes to bed so if you're up until 4 a.m we will be there entertaining and serving you um again and then the following day this is an area that you can enjoy throughout that day as well um yeah and so uh so apart from the experience in the, the bar car, the lounge car, obviously it's about the dining and we have a few great meals on board the, uh, the, uh, the train. It's the cuisine is French, I think it's, uh, and how is that? Like what's, it's, it's obviously all a la carte. Um, you have a menu to choose from. Um, I, I want to hear more about what the, what the dining is. Yeah, absolutely. So um, obviously when you're boarding the Orient Express, you'll be boarding um, late afternoon. Um, and what we do on board is we have two meal services. So as I said, we've got three restaurant cars um, and we will have an early dining and a late dining. Your cabin steward will come to you and will ask you whether you want to eat early or late so we can facilitate your um, preferences. Then once you're sat down, it is just a silver service dinner. and Honestly, the food, if 
you can vision, I'm trying to think of actually the little room I'm sat in, which is quite tiny. Our chefs cook food for up to 176 people wow. in this tiny, tiny little kitchen. Um, and they bring out the most exquisite meals, honestly, the most exquisite meals. If you do the northbound journey, they actually do a lobster brunch, which wow. again is all done out of this tiny little kitchen on board. As the kitchen is tiny, what's quite exciting is as you cross through all the different borders and we pick up fresh produce as we travel. And um, so if you're awake and you happen to be watching what's going on on the platform, you will actually see the local farmer come up with his little trolley and they'll be putting the fresh food in through the window. So if you're doing a northbound journey, it would be lobsters um, being thrown through the kitchen window, um, nice and fresh and ready for you to, to eat later that day. Um, so yes, you would have your, your dinner. Um, the following morning, you would have a breakfast, which is actually served in your cabin. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, every cabin, you have your own dedicated cabin steward and you have a little bell inside your cabin. So when you're ready for your breakfast, whether you've had an early or a late night, depending if you're an early or a late rise, you just push for this, the cabin steward and he'll bring you your um, breakfast into your cabin. And, and champagne is flowing, like you said, all the time. Uh, only if you're in a grand suite. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. So in Otherwise the grand suite, we, we have the champagne and caviar um, on flow. Um, any other drinks are not included um, during the journey, and that is extra. Um, but we do offer um, some drinks packages that can be purchased prior to travel if people want that. Right. But otherwise, uh, yeah, the drinks are sort of as you go. Yeah, perfect. And Absolutely. I, yeah. I guess the selection of wine on board, uh, no issues there. Uh, what, no matter what your budget is, there'll be something there. <laughs> Absolutely. <the> yeah. <laughs> Same for the champagne, wine. Um, and as I said, a, a multiple choice of cocktails in the bar car as well. Um, terrific. And, and so, so you gave us a bit of an overview of the journey. The, the first morning we'll embark in London, we'll t go down on the British Pullman, we'll cross the channel, and in the afternoon, evening, we'll be crossing through France and overnighting on the way down. Um, and then uh, uh, in the morning, we wake up and we pass through the Alps. That's right. Yes, correct. So um, we do stop off in Paris on, on the way. Um, so you, we arrive into Paris probably around 9.30 in the evening. This is a short stop to let some guests um, that board in Paris onto the train. And then from there, obviously, we're traveling through the night, waking up with, um, you know, surrounded by scenery that you can see here, traveling through the Alps, traveling past some of the most beautiful um, lakes in Switzerland as well. Um, obviously, our routes can change from route, uh, from um, date to date. It's just dependent on any potential engineering works. We are operating on public railways, and um, but all of them are absolutely fantastic and actually I was just in Switzerland a few weeks ago and did part of the route on public rail unfortunately not on the Orient Express and um, between uh, Zurich and the Gothard um, Pass and the scenery is is just breathtaking and a lot of the railways in um, Switzerland you're actually right next to the lakes as well so it is lakes mountains um, and then eventually you'll pass through the Italian Dolomites and you'll come down um, into Venice and we pull into Venice um, late afternoon so generally between about 5 30 and quarter to six in the evening um, and I don't know how many of you have been to Venice before but you know it is the city of canals um, so you're getting off the train and you're pretty much from there are getting onto your uh, water taxi and that will then take you off to your hotel of choice um, for the rest of your time that you will spend in Venice. And uh, we do have our own hotel, Belmont Hotel Cipriani, um, which is based on an island actually looking onto St. Mark's Square. Um, so it's a beautiful, different perspective of um, Venice. Uh, and then you're only a short boat, boat ride away to go in and actually explore um, the streets and canals of Venice as well. Absolutely. And, and, and Venice is, uh, again, I know some of our members have been there already. 
but to arrive there on the Orient Express, there's probably no better way to show up in Venice. And uh, I can imagine, I can envision already a trip where we would, uh, we, we would certainly um, spend at least a, a night or two at the wonderful Cipriani, sipping on a Bellini uh, and, and soaking in that, you know, really that's, Venice is, is, is completely unique for that. It's uh, um, one of my favorite cities uh, to visit and uh, a wonderful way to, um, and a, 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 the, the perfect, the penultimate stop um, for the Orient Express. So uh, it's, it's, it's a magical journey. Uh, and um, I think we were talking the other day as well uh, that, um, you know, it, we would, at, at Wheel and Anchor, we'd offer this as part of a longer trip. Obviously, we're not going to go all the way over there just for one night on the Orient Express. Um, but uh, the luggage that you would take with you, you guys transport it separately from, uh, from London all the way down to Venice. So, you know, you arrive in style and luxury and, um, and at your hotel, everything's already there and ready to go. So it's, it's the epitome of luxury train travel. I'd say, Absolutely. Right? And you've got people there serving you, you know, throughout your entire journey and for whatever need you may have, whether it's food or drink, um, you definitely go, go thirsty or hungry. <laughs> yeah, no, no doubt. Um, so I'd like to give an opportunity for our members to ask any questions. And I see a few that have, have come in already. Uh, uh, before we move on and talk about our next train journey, you want to give Laura a chance to, uh, to, to answer some questions. Um, John asked the question, of course, I knew this question was going to come, how much does it cost? <laughs> well, I'll, uh, I'll answer that one for you, Lara. We, uh, we obviously, it will, it will depend on a number of different factors in terms of when we go and which itinerary we do. And, and as I say, it'll be part of a longer trip. Um, I can tell you that the rack rate, the regular rate for the Orient Express uh, it runs around 3,500 to 4,000 pounds, I think, for the uh, one night journey, if uh, my information is correct, Lara. Uh, and so it is not the least expensive train trip that you'll take, um, but uh, I think worth um, every nickel. Um, and uh, uh, Judith asked, uh, is the train, is the experience all inclusive? Uh, and I think you clarified that. What exactly, Lara, is included in the trip uh, and, and what is not? So obviously all of your meals are included, which would be that brunch that I mentioned on the British Pullman. Um, you will have that evening meal. You will have breakfast, lunch the following day. And um, with all of your meals, tea and coffee and water is obviously included. Um, on the British Pullman, you will have Bellinis included. And on the Venice and Pont Orient Express, it is a welcome glass of champagne. All other drinks will be additional. Will be additional. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and obviously, because it's only one night on the train, there's no other excursions or anything else like that. So it's really only beverages. That's your only extra. Correct. Expense. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Uh, and Jenny asked, what's the best time of the year to do the trip? Uh, and so I don't, I mean, I think that's a bit of a matter of opinion. I would think spring or fall um, is kind of my preferred time to go to uh, Europe. The, the, or, the Orient Express doesn't go all year round anyway, but uh, what, what, what is the season for, for this trip? So the season that we operate, it's normally starting middle of March, and that will run through till the middle of November. Um, best time of year to travel. I actually went on the last trip of the year once, so end of uh, middle of November, and I had a fabulous time. Venice was a lot quieter. Mm -hmm. And you have a little bit more exclusivity um, at locations that you go to. Having said that, though, if you're after a bit more heat uh, and you're looking to extend and enjoy the beautiful swimming pool that we have at the Cipriani as well, um, then obviously you would want to go in um, the summer months. Yeah, exactly. And I think I tend to prefer as well Europe in the shoulder season, because as you say, you know, Venice, London, quieter in November. Sure, you might have to put on a uh, you know, a little, uh, a little light sweater or something like that. Uh, but it's, uh, it's just the, the fact that you get to enjoy it with a lot less uh, travelers and makes it makes a huge difference. Eileen asked the question this is a good question. How does Brexit affect the travel? <laughs> well, that is a very good question. Um, at the moment, the only um, challenge we obviously see is the channel crossing. Um, 
we're working on ways to see how we can uh, passenger wise we have no concern and um, luggage wise because we use different vehicles that cross the channel we're just wanting to make sure that uh, everything runs smoothly but at the moment, we don't see a huge impact um, on us being able to operate. Um, we certainly have no plan to um, change any of what we do at the moment, i.e. starting in Paris and not coming all the way through to London. Um, right. So yeah, we, we hope that it will all go smoothly. Um, yeah. Having the fact that we have a deal now, um, I think we won't That's have any challenges. Thing. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, and uh, just one more question. Uh, Helen asked, what is the cost to upgrade to a suite? And obviously, again, that depends on a number of factors, seasonality and otherwise, but just give us a rough ballpark. So we, we do offer dynamic pricing. So a lot of our pricing um, will have a lead in price that obviously as we fill up does the price will go up. And um, so I just wanted to go back to the, the lead in price um, for the twin cabin. And um, if you're looking at low season um, lead in price, it's around £2,500 per person. So about £5,000 for a cabin. For a suite, you're looking at anything from about 6000 to 7000 per person. Um, to be in one of those suites. So 1400 uh, sorry, 14000 for um the suite for the suite. For a couple yeah okay perfect good um good well i don't see any other questions from our members of course uh you know lara and i are in uh, close touch all the time so if you do have a question about this program and we have not put we have not put it into our, our our schedule yet realistically we're probably looking at uh the end of uh 2022 uh, or, or spring of 23, before we offer the Orient Express, we have a lot of other stuff on our agenda before that. Um, but um, uh, uh, you can count on the Orient Express being one of our wheel and anchor programs. Laura, thank you so much for joining us from London today. Thank you very much. Very much appreciate your time, your participation. Um, and bear with us. We are gonna continue on now to the Palace on Wheels as we say goodbye to Laura. Uh, and thank you take care and we look forward to having you all on board uh, very soon very soon and to traveling again <laughs> for sure we hope so as well um good so let's continue over to india and uh, talk about our next uh, incredible rail journey the palace on wheels don't know if you've ever heard of this one or not but uh it has uh, uh, really sort of came into popularity the, the, the whole palace on wheels train similar to the Orient Express was revived as they collected carriages from all over Rajasthan uh, and they launched it. That's actually in this case, almost 40 years ago um, that Palace on Wheels was, was, was brought um, to life. Uh, and there are a few other uh, luxury rail journeys around India. Uh, and, uh, but the Palace on Wheels, the, one, the reason I wanted to feature this one is because it really covers an itinerary that takes in really the highlights of Rajasthan, which I think is uh, the most fascinating part, um, not just for the incredible palaces, the desert scenery, uh, and but you know the wonderful people, the cuisine, there's so much going for it. And I think the Palace on Wheels is a great way to do it. So um, they took this train, as I say, 40 years ago, they took, uh, they made, uh, they took actually old carriages and they made replicas of, uh, of the Maharaja's saloon carriages uh, to, to make it look like and make the experience like as if you were traveling like one of the Maharajas. And I think they've done an, an incredible job of, of doing that. Um, the, the, um, the, the carriages have like four cabins or they call them saloons uh, in every carriage. And they're all decked out with this very ornate, as you can see by the pictures, it looks um, very, uh, um, very detailed. Uh, and, and this, this Indian design um, that you see throughout. I mean, it's not everybody's taste, but I think when you're in India, that's kind of, uh, you know, the, what you expect because you see this all over the place. Um, there is a bar car. There are two restaurant cars. Um, there's really, uh, this train is, for, is, is very long and has a lot of amenities uh, considering uh, the relatively small number of, of passengers that are on it. So compared to a lot of the other trains, there's a lot of places you can go and hang out. Um, and talking about the cuisine a little bit, because it really is one of the most important parts of the, of the experience. 
Um, in the two restaurant cars, they offer not only some of the, the amazing delights of, of Rajasthan cuisine, but also uh, they have a great selection of, uh, of, of international food. Because I know from having traveled uh, with, a, with our, one of our first wheel and anchor groups to India a couple of years back, um, uh, it's nice to, to have some of the, the familiar um, favorites along the way. Um, the train itself um, has two uh, categories of cabins. It has the, the so-called deluxe suites, which are the, the standard compartments that comprise of uh, twin beds like you see in the pictures here. Of course, everything is air conditioned. You have Wi-Fi aboard the train. Um, you have a, uh, an attendant for every single cabin. Um, so you're very, very well looked after. Again, the experience that they're trying to deliver on the Palace on Wheels is as if, as if you each and every passenger was um, a Maharaja in themselves. They, they also came up with two of these super deluxe coaches. Um, so an entire cab carriage, you can imagine a big train carriage is split into two. Um, and they have so-called emerald and di di uh, diamond um, 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 suites, um, which have double beds. They have a sitting, sitting area with a writing desk. I mean, you know, real, real decadence. Um, and in fact, there is a dedicated um, uh, observation car just for um, super deluxe, deluxe passengers. And of course, uh, you know, you, you have the incredible countryside. So even though you, 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 it's comfortable enough to stay, spend time in your compartment, um, but you've also got the, uh, the other places available, the bar car, the lounge car, uh, and, and, uh, and the dining room. So um, let's have a look at the itinerary uh, for the Palace on Wheels trip. Um, and again, what I, what I really like about this itinerary is the fact that you cover all of the highlights of Rajasthan. The train departs from uh, New Delhi, as you'll see in the map here, um, and it heads down through uh, Jaipur and then into the southern parts of Rajasthan before heading out uh, to, the, uh, to the desert in the west and then making its way back to the Taj Mahal, which is, of course, in Uttar Pradesh province, and then back to, um, uh, back to Delhi. And so uh, covering off a little bit of the trip, as I say, it, the, it, it begins and ends in, in India's capital, New Delhi. Uh, which is, I remember the first time that I visited there, I was really, really taken aback by this city um, as to how green it is. And of course, you know, there is Old Delhi and New Delhi and Old Delhi is, you know, very much the India that you can imagine with hustling, bustling markets and traffic that doesn't go in any, you know, it goes in all possible directions and cows on the street. Um, but New Delhi is uh, really a marvel of uh, both modern buildings um, and uh, as well as uh, some of the ancient historical buildings, but big wide tree line boulevards. Um, and so I, we depart out of New Delhi for a seven night trip, um, which takes us all around Rajasthan and um, some of these incredible cities. And I'll, and I'll just touch on the stops along the trip. Um, if you haven't been to India before, uh, this is really a great way to do it. We stop in Jaipur, which is, of course, the capital of Rajasthan and is otherwise known as the Pink City. Uh, and it's really a, a, a city that is famous for artisans and craftsmen and merchants. Um, and um, uh, it's, it's called the Pink City because one of the earlier Maharajas uh, created a, a tradition or a law compelling the residents of the city to paint all their buildings in pink. Um, we were here, you can see a picture of uh, some of our members when we were um, at the Amber Fort, which is the, the, the most important tourist attraction uh, in Jaipur. And you can see this magnificent complex um, that sits all atop a hill with breathtaking views um, all around. And uh, Jaipur is, is truly a terrific city. When we go down to the south of Rajasthan, we hit Sawai Madhapur. Um, and the landscape here changes a bit because Sawai Madhapur is actually the gateway to the Ranthambore National Park, uh, which is one of the larger national parks in India. And it's where you'll, where, where people go traditionally to uh, search out the, the famous Bengal tiger. And of course, tigers are uh, very, very much in danger. There's only 60 left in the entire park, which covers um, several hundred square kilometers. So, you know, the chances of seeing one aren't very high, but, you know, you never know. And, and there's lots of other wildlife to be taken in there. So, you know, it's, uh, again, when, you, when you're on this part of the trip, it's almost like being on a safari 
in Africa because you know you see the the monkeys and peacocks and crocodiles and um, my favorite the hyenas. Um, Ranthambore has a lot to offer. Um, from Sawai Madapur, uh, we head further south, the southernmost point of our of our trip, which is to Chittagar. And Chittagar Fort is the largest one in India. And once again, you know, India is about these magnificent palaces and and temples um, and and forts. Um, and some of the forts. Uh, were, were built back in uh, the 15th and, and 1600s, but of course, um, many of them were used by the British when they occupied uh, India um, during, during all the time that, that, that they were down there. And um, this particular fort is 7,000 acres in size um, and is really, uh, I mean, for me, uh, the, the, that the vastness of it all is what is is particularly impressive. Um, they have even a small little castle or a palace um, in the middle of the fort, which is on its own lake. So you have this fort on a mountain, on a lake, and an island. That, you know, it's 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 remarkable. Um, and as part of our journey, we'll go to the fort in the evening, um, and they have a terrific sound and light show. That, that just sort of lights it up in all kinds of colors. Um, we continue further uh, west on our journey to Udaipur and Udaipur is my favorite city in Rajasthan because it's a city of lakes. Uh, and it, it, it really is uh, um, came uh, to be famous by virtue of the James Bond film, Octopussy that was filmed here, filmed here back in the 1980s and the, the Lake Palace Hotel. And you can imagine the, the James Bond characters um, outside this very, very famous hotel in the middle of the lake. Uh, and it's, it's, it's setting amongst the hills and the lakes with these magnificent palaces. It's, it's a place that I will truly never forget and look forward to going back to. Um, we then head to the westernmost uh, uh, point of our trip, which is Jai Salmar, uh, and uh, this is the Golden City, and it's in the middle of the Thar Desert, so you have a very dry, arid climate around here. In fact, all the buildings are like in sandstone, uh, and uh, I, what, what you'll often see here, because when you're in Jai Salmar, you're not that far from the, the border with Pakistan, and as you, can, as you know, um, and even lately, there's been some tensions there, so you'll often see um, you know, the Indian soldiers going by on their way to the border and, you know, they're all super friendly and, and waving and happy. Um, and uh, we, we will also, while visiting Jai Salmer, take a, take a camel ride um, through the sand dunes and you get a, a real sense of, of being in the desert. Um, we head back east from there uh, to Jodhpur, which is the blue city. So Jaipur, the pink city, Jodhpur, the second largest city in the blue city. Uh, and the, the, the landmark here, again, I will never forget going with our group. There was a lot of steps uh, uh, all the way up to Marangar Fort that you see here in the background. Um, and the, the, uh, the buildings here in one section of the city are all painted blue. And uh, of course, you know, it begs the question, why did they paint them blue? Um, and it wasn't because one of the Maharajas told them to, but there are several very interesting, uh, how should we say, legends as to why it was that um, they may have, have painted the city blue, but I'm not going to tell you because I think it's better to come along the trip and hear the story for yourself. Um, as we go towards the last day of our trip, uh, we'll head over to Bharatpur, which is where we'll disembark for um, a visit to the Keoladio Ghana National Park, which is actually like a massive bird sanctuary, uh, one of the largest in Asia, in fact. Uh, and, uh, and, and the, the World Wildlife Fund recognizes it as one of the, the best places to see birds. So I, I haven't been here. I wasn't uh, able to visit it on my trip. Um, but um, for those at all interested in birding, it's like this huge 30 square kilometer um, area of wetlands during part of the year. And it completely dries up during a different part of the year, which is why you see all these different species of migratory birds. There's over 300 of them um, that come to Bharatpur. So we have that in the morning and then in the afternoon, undoubtedly one of the highlights of any trip to, eat to India, which is, of course, the Taj Mahal. In Agra, we first visit the Agra Fort. Uh, I remember I did it the other way around when I was there. Um, but when you visit Agra Fort, you can see the Taj Mahal next to the river off in the distance. Um, and it's a great way to sort of get a, get a glimpse of this magnificent uh, monument, uh, first from the distance 
And then of course you go there and go through the grand entrance uh, and uh, see what this um, new seven, seventh wonder of the world um, is all about. And of course the, the beauty of it is, is goes beyond words. Um, and uh, after a, uh, our day in Agra, uh, our trip will come to the end with an overnight train journey back to Delhi. Um, that's where our, we will um, disembark from our trip uh, and uh, uh, probably continue on, spend a few more days in, in New Delhi or go to one of the many other places to visit in India. It will all be part of a program that we put together for Wheel and Anchor, as I say, in the not too distant future. So I uh, wanted to give you a little bit of an insight on these two fascinating rail journeys. Again, the interest, our trip inspiration survey that we launched last month showed a great interest in, in rail journeys. So I'm very excited about it. Uh, because I, uh, I, I do uh, anticipate we'll, um, we'll, we'll be in a position to offer a lot and bring our members along. So uh, there are a few questions, but of course, I just stuck up on the screen here our contact information. You probably have it anyway. Um, and, and so if you, don't, if you do have a question, inquiry about the trip, keeping in mind that we don't have dates for it yet, probably will be the latter part of this year before we, uh, before we launch this one. Um, but you can always uh, give us a call and, uh, and uh, ask any questions that you have. Um, in the meantime, just to put in your calendar, our next webinar will be two weeks from now, the 21st of January. We're going to look at our trip inspiration survey results. We're going to find out what everybody said, where people want to go, and where we go from here in terms of planning uh, 2022, because uh, I know everybody is anxious to travel. So let me touch on a couple of the questions that we had about Palace on Wheels. Uh, and so if you do have any, uh, if anyone else has any, please uh, type them in now and I'll get them answered for you. Uh, John said, uh, is it a bumpy train ride? <laughs> well, I can tell you the rail beds in India are not uh, like the rail beds in Europe. Um, uh, I would put them more in the category of, of what they're like in, in Canada. So uh, the train ride is a little bit bumpy at night, but uh, my experience is, and I haven't been on the uh, Palace on Wheels, but rather on one of the other rails uh, journeys in, in India, um, you do get used to it and it kind of lulls you to sleep after a while. Um, Helen asked, is the food on the serve train, served on the train very Indian or Americanized? Yeah, so they have two dining cars. And part of the reason they do that, Helen, is because uh, they uh, have certainly a, a focus on Rajasthani, so Indian cuisine. But you always have a menu of, of Western cuisine and, in fact, also Chinese food available on the train. So, um, so you will never uh, worry about having to eat that curry or that uh, paneer or whatever it happens to be, uh, you've always got a uh, an option for, for food that we're more accustomed to. Um, Paul asked, what time of year is ideal for doing this trip? Um, well, I think that the, the train operates almost year round on a weekly basis. Um, so I would say that the, the best time of the year for traveling to India is either uh, at the very end of the monsoon season, so end of September or October, um, then October, November are, 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 and into December are peak season already, or otherwise sort of March and April before the monsoon returns. Those are the, the best times of the year uh, to go. Um, Paula was saying that a member had asked her about um, how crowded it was touring India and getting on and off the train. Well, the train does uh, have a special platform for it, but that being said that the, the, the stations in particularly Delhi are quite busy. Um, but because this is a very special VIP train uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's luxurious. So it is, it's sort of far beyond the, the, the wherewithal, the means for most, um, most Indians to travel on. Uh, they put a lot of security uh, and they really manage the crowds. But like any travel in India, depending on the time of the year that you go, it's a pretty busy place. So, um, you know, you, you have to be accustomed to not, not so much uh, in, uh, with the train because the train is its own experience but on some of the excursions to some of these passes uh, it can be quite busy. Um, Nora asked um, are all the side trips included on the train? Uh, so with the Palace on Wheels yes again except for uh, beverages pretty much 
everything that is in the program is included. So your meals, you typically have a, a breakfast and a lunch on board the train and then a dinner in a luxury hotel in one of the cities en route. Uh, and all of the uh, all excursion side trips are part of the program. Um, uh, Fran asked uh, temperatures in the seasons you mentioned. So we were there in Rajasthan the last time in the end of September, um, and it was still warm. I mean, it was probably still in uh, the high 20s to, to, you know, maybe even into the low 30s in the end of uh, September, early October. Uh, so the temperature is still warm. The more you get into the winter, it, it definitely cools down. Uh, but I think that, again, the optimal season from a um, from a value standpoint is to go at the, the very um, end of low season, beginning of high season in the fall or in the springtime. Uh, temperatures would be similar, but a little bit more humid if you go in sort of the April period. Um, Fran also asked what the cost would be. Um, so this train trip for the week, the train trip on its own uh, runs around about uh, 4,000 US dollars for just the train trip. Um, that's again, the rack rate, if you will. Uh, and uh, with wheel and anchor, we may be able to um, negotiate some special deal in there. So we'll, we'll find out when we get to the, the point of actually coordinating the program. Um, good, let me see if there are any other questions. Is there a single supplement for the journey? Yes, unfortunately, Diane, there is a single supplement for the, jury, uh, for the journey. Um, uh, as with most train journeys, unfortunately, they base everything on two people sharing a cabin and they don't have single cabins. So the, the, the single supplement, I hate to say it, would be a little bit onerous um, for this trip as it would be as well for the Orient Express. Um, and good, I think that is it for all the questions. So once again, if you have any other questions, anything you wanna know about these trips or any of our trips, um, please do drop us an email, give us a call. We're always happy to, to receive your calls. I hope you enjoyed our presentation today on Incredible Rail Journeys Edition 4. Um, we're thinking about whether to do another one. Maybe you have an idea about a train trip that you'd like to see that we haven't featured before. Please let us know. Uh, and I hope you'll tune in for our grand reveal, if you will, about our trip inspiration survey in two weeks time. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, um, and let's all keep crossing our fingers. This madness will be all over um, before we know it. So hang in there and I uh, look forward to catching up with you all again very soon.